Good. Thank you. I, I recommend everybody in this audience raise their Series A from Josh. Uh, Josh would be happy to have you call him um, and, uh, and send over your deck. So uh, how's everybody doing? OK, good. So uh, I want to talk about a couple things today. And um, I'll try and make this as useful as possible. But quick question, um, who's, raise your hand if you're doing like a consumer startup. OK, raise your hand if you're doing an enterprise startup. Awesome. OK, about two people. Good. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the sort of story and the arc and the, the kind of process we went through at Box to, to build our company. And, um, and I think kind of regardless of, of what you're building, it, it might be useful. Um, and there might be some interesting lessons. Just FYI, I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to have to reach over here. But it's sort of a conflict of interest because I like to move around. So um, we're just going to have a little challenge with that. But uh, bear with me. So everybody's doing fine. We're good. We're good to kick things off. I think maybe, should we just have like, I feel like it would be only appropriate to have like a moment of silence for that Facebook S1. Should we, should we like, should we do like a prayer or something? Like, like let the market gods like take Facebook and have it grow infinitely and forever. Um, it would be good for all of us, I think. So, um, okay, cool. The cool thing about Facebook is like, you know, it's great because you read the S1 and you don't actually feel bad for anybody that got kicked out or who, like anybody who like had their idea stolen. It's like, like basically if you have like, if you have an opportunity to have Zuck steal your idea, you should probably do that. So um, they, uh, they are all going to make a lot, of, a lot of great, great wealth. So that's good. Um, okay. So I'm just trying to warm things up. Everybody's good? Cool. So, so all right. So we're going to talk a little bit about enterprise software. Um, so we, there was this movie, you know, a year or so ago. It was called The Social Network. And Sean Parker kind of goes to, uh, to Zuckerberg at, at, uh, in part of the movie. And he goes, you know, a million dollars isn't cool. Uh, you know, you know what's cool. And I was thinking to myself watching the movie and I was like, yeah, I, I totally know what's cool. I'm, I'm totally ready for, for what's cool. It's, it's enterprise software, right? And, um, and that's not what the answer was. Uh, it was actually a billion dollars. But, the, um, but it got me thinking, like nobody really thinks enterprise software is cool. And, um, and, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. that. But um, believe it or not, I actually didn't always think that uh, enterprise software is as cool as it, as it is. Um, and uh, and I want to talk about kind of how we got to where we are, because I think that's, that's sort of where a lot of people sort of exist right now, is they don't really think it's that exciting of a space. Um, and, uh, and we're obviously trying to change all that. And I know there's a lot of other companies that are, that are doing that as well. So when we started Box, and I'll kind of walk you through how we got here, we started the company in 2005. That's when we initially launched the product. And we had this focus on letting users sort of share and manage and access their information from anywhere. So the idea was really simple. You should be able to have sort of this you know, storage in the cloud that would let you get to your data. It wasn't called the cloud back then, but, but the idea was exactly the same. You should be able to go anywhere and have your data. And, um, and so we started the company in 2005. But really, it was kind of the period was like 2004 was the real genesis for this idea was when we really started to see a lot of the, the pains that, that, uh, that were causing us to want to go start Box. Um, the internet in 2004 looked a little bit like this. So it was like this barren sort of deserted landscape. Um, the, the happier camel is Google. Um, I think the one that's sort of sad is Yahoo. But it was, it was, it was like there wasn't a lot of stuff going on, right? So who is here in the valley in 04, 05? Okay, so, so some veterans, um, the, uh, and you'll remember that like, it just wasn't, not that much stuff was going on. And, and so when we started Box, the, the 2004 and 2005 landscape was actually just a bunch of companies that, uh, that had sort of barely survived the 90s and the early 2000s, so xDrive and iDrive and Driveway and all these different companies that sort of had merged that were, were trying to solve this problem of letting you get to your data from anywhere. And when you fast forwarded to 2004, um, to 2005, you actually had this series of, of changes that, that had happened in the world that a lot of these companies weren't responding to. So when we looked at the market, we identified about three brand new major kind of macro factors um, that were, were going to cause this sort of the next generation of this company to emerge and be far more powerful. We saw that the cost of storage had gone down by about a factor of eight. So um, to put together the same hard drives to store data in 99 or 2000 would have cost you an eighth of the amount of money um, by the time you would have done this in 2004. Fast forward now today, it's actually we're about a 40th um, of the amount of money we have to spend on hard drives than, than, than about uh, 12 years ago. So you know, 
God bless Moore's law, that, was, that made all of this far more efficient. So we could actually store data more cheaply. We had more powerful browsers and networks, right? So far more people were on cable modems and, and cable internet, and uh, far more people were, you know, you sort of started, I, I think Firefox had just come out, but, but we had far better capabilities with our technology and our browsers, so people wanted to use sort of web-based services. And there were more locations and people to share with. So we just literally had more connected devices. Um, and we sort of anticipated that there'd be a lot more places that, that people would want to share from um, and people would want to share with. Now, this is obviously pre-iPhone, but we figured, you know, what the hell, you might as well get your files from this thing, right? Uh, we didn't really, I don't think we actually knew exactly how you were going to do that, maybe like SMS you the data or something. But, but we knew that eventually you'd want to be able to get your, to your data from any device. And so you had these big factors by 2004, 2005 that had changed and none of these previous companies had responded to those. So we figured that's a, you know, a pretty good, um, uh, that's a pretty good thesis for starting a company. So we put up a quick version of the, of the product. We uh, built it in a couple months and, and then launched it. And all of a sudden, um, instantly, we sort of had product market fit. Like, this is sort of magical. Like, instantly, like the first version of the product, people started using and they started being uh, attracted to. And, um, you know, we didn't really, we didn't call it PMF. We, we just said that people were signing up and that was very exciting. And um, we started getting some initial traction and uh, that was going very well. And again, just for some background, so we started the company in 2005 while we were in college. My co-founder and I, um, I was down in LA. My co-founder was, was on the East Coast. Um, and, uh, and we were starting to build up the company. And we had actually funded the entire company from my co-founder's online poker winnings. So, um, so we were actually running the, the entire site off of, uh, off of this, uh, um, this, this poker winnings. And then you know, online poker became illegal. So it was sort of harder to, to keep funding the business through that. And we had to spend more time on things. So we decided like, we will now decide to go and build this as a real company. So the first thing you do um, when, uh, when you want to you know, make a, a real business is you obviously go and find angel investors. And so we, we tried to do that. So we, we actually started pitching a lot of um, angel investors up in Seattle initially. It turns out just as a FYI, um, uh, F Seattle is about five years behind Silicon Valley in any given period of time. So, so try not to, to you know, do too much up there. Um, but the, um, anybody from Seattle? I know of actually a couple of people that are. Yeah, woo! All right, one person. So nobody even knows what I'm talking about. Great. So, um, so the poker winnings dried up, and we decided that we were going to go raise money on our own and, and, uh, and build the business. And one of the challenges uh, you know, of, of um, it's actually kind of challenging to, to go raise venture capital when uh, your, your co-founder and CFO looks like this. Um, so uh, this is actually him at uh, at 20 years old. Um, it's you know it's really difficult to go into a VC and um, and pitch them when uh, they think that your co-founder is going to run off to Disneyland with the money. So <laughs> we we had this problem where where you know we you know we were, like we got discounted because of this guy and um, I didn't look that much better, but but still it's easier to show him. Um, and uh, and we finally got lucky. This this really crazy guy who actually probably didn't know what we looked like uh, named Mark Cuban. Um, uh, eventually invested in the company, and that was really exciting. So, um, if you ever have the chance to to get Mark Cuban as an investor, um, you know you should think about it. Uh, and uh, and it's really fun because he's pretty crazy, and uh, and he's actually a, a pretty sort of visionary investor. But we uh, we raised some money from him, and uh, and we were seeing some good success. Um, and uh, we went back to school that semester, but then eventually decided that we were we were just dealing with too much stuff. Right? We were answering customer phone calls from our accounting class, um, and uh, it was just becoming too difficult to both run the business and stay in school. So we decided um, at, the, uh, at the sort of disappointment of our, our parents initially to, to drop out and, and move to the, the Bay Area, actually. Um, so, so God bless this, this place. But um, the, uh, um, so things started picking up. And what's interesting is when you initially say that, that you're going to drop out of college, um, you know, some of the more uh, ex you know, excitable people start thinking about you know, amazing stuff like, wow, you know, Bill Gates, he dropped out of college. That's going to be really exciting. Or, or Michael Dell, yeah, he, he also dropped out of college. And look how well that turned out. Or, or you know, Steve Jobs obviously you know, dropped out of college. And that was really exciting. No one ever really remembers this guy that dropped out of college. <laughs> So there was actually more risk than, than you know, initially we thought. Right? You, you sort of hold up, the, obviously, the big guys, but you never really think about everybody else that, that also drops out of college and, and it doesn't quite work for. So, so anyway, we, were, we had sort of this realization that we had to go focus on the business. We had to focus on it full time. But there was still going to be some risk involved. We moved out to the Bay Area and, um, and, and decided to build up the company. So this was sort of, I'm sure a lot of people have been through this period or you're in this period right now where like, we, we, we have the site. It's growing every, pretty much every single night. 
we would change our business model. So right, we had this funny thing because it was four of us. We were living in the same place and working in the same place. And then we had this funny thing where pretty much if you fell asleep before at a minimum of two other people fell asleep, by the next morning the business model had changed from on you. So like it was just always like this thing where like you were afraid to go to bed because something fundamentally we would have pivoted uh, in the middle of the night. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that, so, but it was a lot of fun. We were, we were really excited. We were growing the business and, and everybody was having a good time. And we actually had opened up the product for free users. So when, when we initially launched the site, we were thinking about profits and losses and, and we decided that, that we would, you know, the only way to make that work with, a, with minimal poker winnings was to charge for the product. And um, we, uh, when we moved to the Bay Area, um, and you actually met Josh Stein, so Josh raised our, helped us raise our, uh, and led our, our Series A. Um, once we really kind of worked out the model where we wanted to then open up the product for, for free um, and let anybody sign up, and it was, it was great, because instantly we now had hundreds of thousands of people that were signing up for the product um, once we introduced that free version, which was totally awesome, and, um, and it gave us a lot more scale to be paying attention to, and, and it showed that more and more people wanted storage and, and, uh, and this service in the cloud. But things eventually sort of started stalling strategically, right? We had this issue where we, we had a lot of traffic, a lot of users, but we were sort of, you know, not really finding our way, right? It wasn't really obvious what we would look like in three or five or ten years, right? If you were to say, what does this business kind of become over time, um, we didn't have an obvious answer. And we, we discovered that we were actually sort of in this chasm. Um, and for those of you familiar, this is just what a chasm looks like. It's not a good thing. Um, it's, uh, it's basically, if I can move my mouse, it's sort of when you grow initially and then you fall into this hole. Um, and, uh, and a lot of technology sort of ends up there. Let me give you some examples just so it's clear. Um, so <laughs> sort of have chat roulette or, or wave really never quite figured out a sustainable model for people. Obviously, you know, Pinterest sort of defied gravity and kind of skipped the whole chasm period. Um, so uh, now that is exciting, and, uh, and then you have sort of IBM uh, over a long period of time ends up selling to sort of laggard um, uh, customers and, and companies. So uh, we found ourselves in this point right around here where we're, we, we really just did not know how we were going to jump over the hurdle. How were we going to make this product and, and technology mainstream? Are we all on the same page so far? We're good? Okay, good. Is this the right pace? Sometimes I have to slow down because people aren't listening fast enough. So are, is this, are we good? Okay, thank you. So, all right. So we found ourselves in this chasm and we needed to, to get out of it and we, we started looking in the data and we actually got a lot of help from Josh um, to, from a business model standpoint. We started looking around and, and we wanted to figure out, well, how are we going to leap over this, this sort of chasm? And we realized that we were basically underserving the enterprises or the businesses that were using Box and we were over-serving the consumers that were using Box. So, um, if you're not familiar with this speak, the idea is that like, for a business that wanted to use our product, we didn't have all the functionality that they needed for them to be really successful with our technology. So they were, they were sort of just lost in this. Um, it was really cool on the low end, but they couldn't really scale it up for many people and, it, and they, they couldn't integrate it into their business um, for sharing data or, or working on information. And for consumers, we had too much functionality um, for solving their basic problem of, uh, of, of sharing data and, and getting access to information anywhere. And so we were at this sort of juncture where, um, where uh, uh, effectively we looked like a spork where we just didn't, it wasn't obvious which one we were optimized for. And, um, and actually I'm a big spork fan, but, the, but not everybody else is. And actually I don't know that anybody knows the, the sort of market cap on sporks, but um, you know, not super large. And, uh, and we realized that, that we had to be better defined for this world that, that we were going to emerge into um, if we wanted to be successful. So we had to choose one. And so the way we did this is we, we sort of dove in to the customer base, we dove into the product, um, and we wanted to figure out what's going on under the hood and what are people telling us. So we did this sort of very basic thing that, that is not that novel of an idea. We actually just talked to our customers. And when we talked to the consumer users, we basically discovered that they had many alternatives. Um, so when we talked to them, they would talk about how you know, they could Gmail themselves their, their files, or um, they could um, put their data on Apple's mobile me product, or you know, Yahoo had this feature called um, uh, Yahoo Briefcase. Um, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with this company, Microsoft. Um, they, they had you know, about five different services that were competing against us. So when we talked to the average consumer, we said, well, what would you use if you weren't using Box? They actually had like, you know, uh, the, they, they like Box a lot, but they had a list of other things that, um, that they could be using instead and for roughly the same price. And that was sort of the kicker, was like, 
was they could use us for free, or they could use something else for free, uh, or they could pay us $4.99 for our upgraded version, or they could you know, pay mobile me another five bucks or, or 10 bucks. And so we didn't really like this. Um, it was sort of felt like we were being attacked by, by stormtroopers on all angles. And, um, and we realized that that was not gonna be super effective. So we, we figured, okay, well, we're gonna have to be far more competitive in the consumer space um, if this is what we're gonna wanna go do. And then when we talked to our enterprise customers, we, we, we heard something kind of completely different, and it was that they hated their alternatives. So when we would talk to an enterprise customer, they only told us about these problems that they had with their other solutions, right? When they were, the, the whole reason they came to us in the first place was because they had problems um, with other services that, uh, that sort of created the illusion that they were gonna help them run their business. And when you think about the enterprise world in 05 um, or even earlier, um, if you're in IT, you basically have to manage all of this technology, right? So if you want to store data in a business, you have to put together NetApp and, and EMC storage, you have to put together servers that are going to help you run your applications, then you're going to put together you know, Microsoft SharePoint on top of that, then you're probably going to need a search engine from uh, Autonomy, and then you're going to have to put applications all together that, that you're going to run your business from, then you're going to have to integrate all of this with a firewall, and then you're going to need consultants, and you're going to need to maintain that, and it's all going to need to work perfectly, and every time you upgrade it, it's going to all fall apart. And this is what our customers were dealing with. And they, they sort of got sold this vision that there would be this sort of magical rainbow of enterprise value at the end of that. And most enterprise customers just literally never have seen that, that uh, pot of enterprise rainbow gold. And, um, and, and they were telling us this. And so when we asked them, well, in an alternative world, how much would you be spending to solve the problem that, that we theoretically could be solving? They would tell us that, that, that it would be between 10 and 100 times more money. So we talked to this one customer, it was really eye-opening, where they were paying us $8.99 per month. And we said, well, what would your alternative be? And they said about $200,000. So I was like, I was, okay, all right, this is, so should we be consumer or should we be enterprise? And this is sort of not like an Einstein grade problem, right? Like it's like, it's like we have one market where you know, there, there are free subsidized alternatives that even in the best case people aren't going to pay a lot of money for. Um, and there was always these rumors of G Drive and, uh, and other you know, products coming on the market. Or you go into a space where the expectations have been set so low that basically anything you do um, will be better than that. And people have this massive amount of money that they're going to be spending on this technology. And so if you do innovate in that space, um, there's a huge premium and a huge, um, and a huge value that you can create if, you, if you're able to do that innovation. So um, we chose enterprise. And, uh, and that's what we sort of got to this point of, where we were at this juncture. And, and uh, you know, I think in modern times, again, you'd, you'd probably call that a, a pivot. To us, this was sort of narrow focus um, and decide and deciding to focus just on the enterprise area, but do so in such a way where we put all of our energy, all of our effort, all of our investment, all of our people um, and R&D behind the enterprise you know, product and technology. The problem was, was that we were really worried because enterprise software was just really unsexy, right? So it was like, you gotta imagine, you know, we were, we were in our, our, still our early 20s and um, everything about the enterprise was sort of freaking us out. Like this was not the, the sexiest place that we could go spend our time. All of our friends were launching photo sharing, you know, companies and, and widgets on MySpace and if you remember MySpace and all, all of these, all these different kind of things that, that were, you know, seemed far more exciting than, um, than enterprise software. And, and this makes sense, right? If you go ask like a random person, what do they think of enterprise software? Like what comes to mind um, when, hey Mamoon, how you doing? Um, I'll, I'll introduce you later, like you were supposed to do for me. All right, so anyway, good point. So, um, uh, okay. So basically, um, you, you had this world where, where enterprise just isn't that sexy, right? When most people think of enterprise software, they sort of think of this, right? They, this is sort of my best Steve Ballmer doing his, his pirate impression. If you don't see it, it sort of looks like that. So it's like, arr, <laughs> right? And that's unfortunately the, the, what, what comes to mind when most people think of enterprise software. And so we said, if we're gonna do this, we have to do this very, very differently. Um, and, uh, and it was like you had, you had this issue where like everything about the culture was gonna change. We'd go from being engineering and product and marketing to we'd have to get you know, sales guys with, with gold rings and uh, they'd probably pull up in a Porsche and their name would be Chuck. No offense if anybody here is Chuck, but um, and it's, they sort of look like this. Um, and it's like, it's like this guy's gonna roll in and, and wanna sell you enterprise software and, and we just didn't believe, is somebody named Chuck here? Okay, I don't know. Right, so, um, nobody looks like this, right? Okay, all right, so, um, so we just were afraid that, that how are we gonna you know, map our culture 
of speed and innovation and, and product design in a world where technology is just bought through very slow cycles that, that, that uh, take a lot of time and, and people don't find to be super innovative. Um, and so we basically said if we're going to do this, um, we're going to make sure that we do it differently. So if we do enterprise, we're going to build a very different kind of enterprise software company. And this is actually an important lesson because we were able to take a lot of the sort of standard beliefs that the industry had and we were able to kind of invert them um, in, in terms of building a different kind of company um, with a different kind of culture. So, so today, you know, we, we sort of fuse these two worlds where in the consumer space you have speed and you have you know, rapid product innovation um, and you have things like virality and in the enterprise you have security and integration and, um, and obviously uh, a, a lot of the, the, the deep expertise that is necessary to go into big businesses and we want to find that fusion between those two worlds and uh, that, that's sort of what we're very focused on at Box and, and how we kind of compete today. So we decided that, that if we're going to build a different kind of enterprise software company it would be one that has very simple solutions and simple software, so we want technology that humans can use, right? Most of the enterprise has long been defined by technology that you don't get to choose to use, you're sort of forced to use because of, um, uh, be because of your CIO or, or your IT administrator. So we want a world where even if it is the CIO that does implement this technology, it's something that you would choose to use um, if you could. So, uh, so that's how we focus on simplicity, um, that's how we focused on, on end user experience and elegance of the product and making sure that it's something that, that, that users will either go out and choose to use use um, or something that they're going to like. Um, we, we looked at the business model of the enterprise world and the enterprise world is basically you have these very sort of entrenched channels uh, and ways of marketing and selling solutions um, that are very much about we're going to build a product for three years and then we're going to pump it down this channel and, and through these set of providers to, to get to market. And we said well what if we could invert that because we're not going to be able to compete with um, Microsoft or EMC or Oracle or SAP um, in the same way that, that they um, are going to market. So we're going to have to figure out a better, higher leverage way where we can distribute the product through the end users. And that was the, the idea of the, the sort of freemium model applied to the enterprise, where you sort of have the best of both worlds. You have individuals who don't have large budgets, but do have large problems, so let them choose their solution. And then you have CIOs, um, or the administrators of the businesses that have budgets, they, they don't have much time, so they want to choose the solution that their end users like that's gonna be secure enough. And how do you fuse those two models together to, to, to create something that is, um, is very competitive with traditional players? Um, we also wanted to focus on customer delight. The, the interesting thing in the enterprise, um, especially in the sort of software as a service space, is that you are completely tied um, and uh, connected connected to your customers at all times. In traditional enterprise software, you sort of sell something and then it's their responsibility if it gets implemented or if it gets, um, uh, if it gets maintained or managed, right? They, you, you make the money as the vendor, but then the customer has to go out and be successful at the solution. So we decided we were going to focus on, uh, on, on making sure that, that we keep our customers super successful and obviously we have a huge economic um, uh, incentive to do so. We also wanted to have open systems. So instead of all of this technology coming in from Oracle um, or IBM or Microsoft where you sort of have to buy everything from them to run your business, we sort of are moving to a world where, um, where you're going to have horizontal solutions that are far more open. So we said we're going to be all, we're going to be far more about openness. And, and then finally just constant innovation. So how do you take the sort of mindset and mentality and ideology of a consumer internet company about rapid iteration, rapid testing, um, using data as your guide for a lot of things, getting and rolling out new products as soon as you can with the sort of mind frame and mindset of, of building this for the enterprise and where your customers are fundamentally enterprise customers. So um, it's about sort of applying that innovation um, so it's delivered on demand and it's really helpful because we're competing against a company that delivers their updates every three years. So by the time that SharePoint is building a new version of its product, something like the iPad has emerged and completely disrupted the entire mobile ecosystem. So, and they haven't built that with that in mind. So um, that's the, the sort of focus on innovating on demand. So that's how we're building an enterprise software company that, that doesn't suck. And that's sort of how we got to, to where we are. I tried to pull out a couple lessons that, um, that, that might be applicable more broadly for any business. And, uh, and I thought I'd just go through those really quickly. So, um, so what have I learned so far in the Valley? Um, uh, so here are a couple things. Um, one is tackle ignored um, or unsexy problems. Um, obviously, unless you enjoy not standing, don't, uh, not being able to stand out. So, um, but the idea is, is uh, when we were pitching venture capitalists in 2007 and, and 2008 um, about this enterprise software revolution, right? It was completely sort of, um, uh, it was, imp it was impossible to see that, that this wave of companies like Workday or Zendesk or Yammer or Good Data or all of these technologies um, were going.
going to emerge um, and be so powerful. So um, a lot of investors thought that, that we would be, it would be just impossible to either compete with the Microsofts or the EMCs um, or the SAPs or the IBMs of the world, or that the problems weren't big enough or the spaces weren't large enough um, to pay attention to. And, um, and that's actually usually a really good model for deciding um, to spend your time in that area. So um, any time where, where you do have a category or space that, that is perceived as unsexy but has a lot of scale, um, somebody's going to eventually get that right um, and be able to stand out and, uh, and be able to kind of attack that problem. So that, that's a huge lesson. Um, you know, one thing about running a company that I've learned is, um, is it's very, very easy to compromise on things, um, but it's very dangerous to do so. So the, um, and this is sort of just running the business nuts and bolts. Like we've run into a lot of things where as you're building a company, um, and uh, don't compromise on your PC tools either. Uh, make sure that you have the best security on your computer at all times, right? So just in case you're getting spyware mid-presentation, you want to alert, you want to address that. Can I close it? Okay. So seriously, hackers are everywhere and they are on demand. So, um, so you don't want to compromise on anything, right? And, and this applies to how you hire people, right? Everybody sort of knows the A's, hire A's kind of model, but, but it actually shows up very quickly as you're building an organization where you will choose, to, you will choose speed and you'll choose, um, you'll choose sort of low friction um, for, for quality in a lot of cases. Um, and this happens you know, throughout all organizations in, in all areas. Um, and it's really important to hold up uh, that, uh, uh, that is a critical thing where uh, if you're starting a company, one of the best sort of, one of the greatest pieces of value you have is that you get to make your own decisions. Um, and so not compromising is, is really critical for that. So in all of the touch points that your customers have with you, it's super important to sweat all of the small things. So every interaction that, that you have with the customer, every interaction that they have with your website, um, every product that you put together, this is sort of all the, the power that you have. And one of the reasons why we don't work for, for gigantic companies is because we can um, uh, affect this kind of change um, in the organization. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is a big one for us. Uh, find a tornado and ride it. Um, and this is probably mixing at least a couple different metaphors, so um, I apologize. But the idea is, right, what can you be attached to that you can effectively grow at the rate of. Um, and so this is really important because every, you know, in the Valley, every 18 months, there's some new massive technology cycle, right? Um, you know, 18 months ago, we barely had the iPad, right? But then all of a sudden, it completely changed people's expectations around mobility, for instance, in the enterprise. So for us, it was critical to instantly start developing on the iPad to make sure that the rate of organizations adopting iPads was the rate of adoption of iPads we can effectively grow um, at, at that rate because um, Apple is going to be able to sell more technology than, than we're going to be able to. So we better be attached to, to that as a growth market. Um, and, uh, and this is something that I think if you look at the, the sort of most successful companies um, over a 5, 10, 20 year period, they're constantly doing this, right? You're sort of always finding out what wasn't possible three years ago that we should now be doing because it's completely changing the market, right? If you're doing something that was possible three years ago, you're probably not on a tornado. Right? You're probably not riding some wave um, that is going to be able to lift your ship um, as a company. And so, so really being able to proxy to something that as it grows, you're going to be able to grow along with it has, has certainly taught us a lot and, uh, and been super effective for, for figuring out what to do next and, and how are you going to make sure you're relevant for, for your customers. Um, this is sort of a, a corollary to that, but, but or, or a corollary to the first one, but don't compete head on, right? Um, this is pretty obvious, but you see this you know, so often, right? Any time that you say in a sentence that my, my product is sort of better than X, um, you've already lost, right? It should be so different than X that, that it shouldn't even be relevant, right? Um, and, uh, and this is super effective because as soon as you're having to go heads up um, with competition in a sales conversation or to the consumer, um, it's really not a great place to be as a startup. Because you need sort of an order of magnitude, more differentiation from your competition for, for you to stand out in the, in the kind of stage that, that a startup is going to be at um, as you're growing. So it's really, really critical um, that, uh, that you're not competing with other players head on, but that you're doing something so different um, and so relevant for what has changed in the past kind of three or five years that it's going to be able to kind of um, be very obvious what separates you from, from everything else. Of course, unless you enjoy pain and suffering. So, um, uh, and then the, the final thing is that, that we've learned is really to follow our customers. Um, you know, there's, it's obviously critical that you have a vision around your product and your technology and that you're synthesizing um, that on behalf of your customers and all the various data points um, that are in your business. But it turns out that the customers are 
probably the greatest form of insight for, for your product, not just what they're doing um, and not just what you see that they're doing because that can really only, you can only get data um, based on what you've already built, um, but rather where do they want you to be going, right? When we had that one phone call with our customer who was paying us $8.99 and we discovered that for you know, five or 10 other features, this product would be a $10,000 product for them. That was a very big eye-opening experience that then led to kind of everything um, that we've eventually done. So let your customers kind of take you into the market. Obviously make the decision of, of if that's gonna be important for you or if that's gonna be strategic, um, but you should always have your um, ears open to, to what they're telling you because that's where sort of all the, um, the, the real information is. Um, they do have the answers. And of course, um, if all of this advice doesn't work, um, we are hiring, so um, feel free to to, uh, feel free to email me, um, but, uh, but definitely good luck on, on your startup. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that is my presentation, um, so thank you, and I don't know if there's... We have time for questions, and there's a mic so on the floor. Okay, cool. Is everybody drinking or what? <laughs> you are? Or you have a question? Okay. okay. Um, do you guys plan to um, start creating documents to even be more competitive to SharePoint? Yeah, great question. Um, the, well, so uh, maybe we should grab some time later uh, to talk about the future of the internet and documents, but the, um, uh, it's a long conversation and you need to be high for it. But the, um, uh, so the, the future is very confusing, right? We live in this in-between world right now where we have a lot of devices that are emerging that don't really have sort of native file systems, right? That, that is in kind of a pure, like what's so cool about the iPhone and the iPad, and you're gonna regret asking this question. Um, what's so cool about these devices is they're basically sort of these information kind of access you know, platforms, right? And they're just thin clients and terminals for all of this data um, to, to come in and, and stream in. And that's gonna dramatically change how we're creating content in the next kind of five to 10 years. So um, whether or not we build things ourselves or whether or not we introduce kind of platform features um, or you build things yourself, um, if that's what you're saying, um, uh, then building that on top of Box, obviously that's gonna be really critical for us because we wanna be able to be the best place for people to manage their data. Um, but we know that's gonna come from a, a variety of new places over the next kind of five to, to 10 years. So we should talk, Mr. Document Guy. Okay. Yeah. How many users did you have before you went for angel or VC funding? So how many users were using Box? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so again, we we had this um, we had this slightly we were at a slightly different period in time. So again, we had a pay only product when we raised our angel money. So we had maybe uh, five thousand like users. <laughs> so it's like like you know orders of magnitude smaller than, than ideally uh, what you want. But but again, they were all paying. So um, so we had some pretty good data about what was going on. And then by the time we raised A or B or whatever, it was in the millions. Hey. <clears throat> um, so for when you're getting the customer what they want in the enterprise model, a, a lot of things, uh, one of the things about enterprises is each company is so different that the things that they specifically want can change. Yep. You get one feature set or product done for one enterprise customer and the next one wants six completely different things. How do you not let that deter from the product goal or vision? Yeah, so the, um, that's sort of like the quintessential challenge in the enterprise is, and this is, this is again why it has traditionally not made a super great uh, venture capital investment because you find yourself having to build a lot of products and technology on spec for individual customers that then that doesn't apply to you know, even customers in the same industry. So what you, you re this is where sort of ninja product management uh, kind of skills really come into play. So what you need to do is, is best sort of synthesize what is the stuff that, that is sort of, what, what is stuff that's fringe, first of all, um, and then you know, figure out a way to kind of negotiate that out. Um, but what are the things that, that can be abstracted out from the core? Um, and what are the things that need to be built in you know, to the central product? And a lot of people, um, unfortunately, don't create that segmentation where you will build everything into the core product and then instantly, for one customer, you've ruined it for every other you know, customer that's out there. So um, the idea is keep a very, very simple core product Make sure that the, the product is effectively platform 
um, it ties to the point where they can kind of plug and play on the other additional components and do heavy evangelism and education about why that customer is going to be more successful in the way that, that has been designed um, as long as you're still being able to fundamentally solve, solve your problem. So it's really a two-way conversation to well, solve the customer's problem. It's really a two-way conversation um, and it's all about building a product that, that can sort of abstract that complexity from the core and especially never to the end user. Uh, and that's the, that's the, the sort of big challenge in, in this space is, um, is you know, SharePoint as a great example is over time it basically amalgamated every single feature um, that every customer ever needed until this point where it's a Swiss army knife and it's not easy or successful for any one thing that it's trying to solve. Uh, and that's, that's obviously what you want to avoid um, if you're building a, a technology company. Okay, we have one time oh for one more question. Okay. Last question right here, Aaron. Oh, God. Hey, how you doing? Good. Off how the are record. you? No. No, off. <laughs> so what okay. are your, well, funny you should ask. What are your, uh, uh, your well finance, what are your VC capital raising plans there? Um, oh, great question. Uh, the, uh, I will let you read the S1 when it comes out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no S1, I'm just kidding, guys. We, we can talk offline. Do you, wait, do you want to invest? <laughs> okay, okay. All right. He wants to report on it. Cool. All right. We, uh, is this it? We have to, I have to leave now? We okay. Leave. All right. what, what, one, cool. one other quick question since you didn't really answer that yes. one. Oh, no, that's right. cool. Uh, I'll make all of my questions then unsuccessful. Yeah. Just question on when you decided to go from a paid model to freemium. Where's the sound coming from? Oh, right here. Okay. Um, how, were you ever worried that that was going to cannibalize whatever revenue you already had? And how did you, you know, make that call to go to freemium? Yeah, we were making like $5,000 a month. So um, that was, yeah, we, it was going to be low cannibalization. That's like, like low grade Donner Party kind of stuff. So, all right, very good. Thank you. Well, Aaron was a great speaker. Okay, I just want on, to ask everybody. Wait, but hold on, let me just, actually, now let me give you the real answer though, had we had a problem. The, the, okay, <laughs> okay. The, the thing about freemium, so it, it doesn't work for all businesses. You have to understand that, that it works great in environments where creating friction at the start of the funnel is a bad idea for the long-term success of your customer or if, if by having no friction, you can still attract them either way. So a great example is um, uh, who does the MailChimp or whatever, right? Like MailChimp's great because it's, it's freemium, but any time it's successful for me, I'm going to need to email more people. So it's actually a really great way to reduce the friction in starting the service, but eventually they know that a large percent of their customers are going to come in. So if you have a big market or if you have a really obvious reason that people coming in faster will be better for your business, or if you have another way that you can sort of monetize that customer through a different person in that organization, that's a good idea. Thanks. Okay. Aaron, it sounds yes. like you were a good online poker player. So no, how no, much my co-founder. Oh. I was horrible. I actually lost, I think I actually lost most of my money to him and that's how he funded it. So. How, did it, how much did you guys win to fund it? Uh, he, uh, it, was, it was some good, it was some good four-figure shit, so. <laughs> okay, well, I, I hope everyone was listening okay. fast enough okay. to your Thanks speech. Thanks a lot. Thank Take you. care. Aaron. Thank you. Okay.